Hello, this is Anthony, and welcome to another video. This will be the first episode in a series I'm going to call Showcases. In each episode in this series, I'm going to pick a piece of software, in most cases something I've worked on, and tell you about it in detail. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about a project I wrote called Future F-Strings. At a high level, Future F-Strings aims to backport the new F-String syntax from Python 3.6 to earlier versions of the language. I originally came up with the idea for trying something like this while arguing about string formatting strategies on a pull request to Talks. One of the other Talks maintainers suggested that Guido should have invented f-strings earlier, and I got the crazy idea to try and make that possible. So I'm first going to talk about how you would use future f-strings, and then we'll jump into exactly how it works. So the first thing that you'll want to do is install the library, and that can be done with pip. And you would install just like any other Python library. Now we're going to show the very simple basic demo that comes in the readme. Uh, and it's just this very basic hello world program. So the first thing that you'll notice is you need to include this special coding pragma. This would replace the UTF-8 coding pragma if you had it in your file. This is kind of the magic that makes this thing work at all. And then beyond that, you would just write normal f-strings code as you normally would. And if we try and run this, you'll see that even with Python 2.7, this works. And there's no tricks here. Python 2.7 is, in fact, Python 2.7. Um, it works as you would expect. It also does more complicated substitutions. So if we look at this other demo that I have, uh, which imports a module, calls a function inside of an F string, and also does some basic math, uh, you'll also see that this example works as well. So, given that this works, let's figure out how it works. So now we're looking at the source of future fstrings.py. I'm going to show how this works by working from the bottom up. The first thing that you'll see here is a main function. This is what powers the future fstring show command. The command line interface is useful for debugging the source transformation that we'll get to in a bit. Up from that, you'll see the implementation of the Codec API. A Codec is an interface which provides a bunch of helpers for taking bytes and converting them to text. Some common codecs that you've probably used are UTF-8 and ASCII. The Python standard library also gives you facilities for writing custom codecs. The API for writing a custom codec is to write a function which is past the codec name and either returns the codec info or none. I'm using the get method of a dictionary to implement this. Notice that the encoding portions of my codec reuse the UTF-8 implementation, and the only interesting bits of my codec are those that decode. Above that, we define the decoding portions of the codec. Note that we're really only doing any modifications if the interpreter itself doesn't already support f-strings natively. There's three portions of the codec API that do decoding. The stream reader and incremental decoder are shown here. These two are implemented using the third portion, the decode function. One tricky thing that I needed to do here was implement the stream reader in a deferred fashion, such that it decodes the entire file at once. This is necessary because syntax rewriting requires the entire source for parsing. Up from that, we see the decode function. This is really where the magic happens. The first part of the decode function simply takes the bytes and uses the UTF-8 encoding to produce text. Then it uses tokenize RT to rewrite the source. Tokenize RT is a library that I wrote to do round-trip source rewriting via the tokenizer. In an implementation which does not support f-strings, an f-string will appear as a name token containing f, immediately followed by a string token. If the encoding finds this pattern, it will replace these two tokens with a rewritten token. The token rewriting is done inside make f-string. Make f-string basically parses the f-string and transforms that into a format call. Each bracketed f-string expression becomes a single positional argument in the call to dot format. Above that is a pure Python port of the f-string parser from Python 3.6. If you want to see the C implementation, it sits in python slash ast.c in the cpython source tree. It's basically a simple state machine. Putting that all together, future f-string provides a codec which takes UTF-8 bytes, decodes them to text, and then rewrites any f-string syntax into backward compatible string format calls. Next we'll look at how this encoding gets registered during interpreter startup. 
In order to understand how we get our encoding registered, we need to dive into interpreter startup. The interpreter startup involves a lot of stuff, but we're going to primarily focus on one of the last things it does, which is import the site module. One of the side effects of importing the site module is that site.addSiteDir will be called for each import route. The import route that we really care about is the import route for site packages. This is the folder in which pip will install third-party libraries, such as future f-strings. Along with adding the directory to sys.path, addSiteDir will also find all files in that directory which end with .pth and perform some actions based on their contents. For each line in a path file, if that line begins with import and then whitespace, that line will be executed. Otherwise, that line refers to a directory and will be added to sys.path. When installed, future fstrings writes a path file into site packages that uses slash abuses the site machinery. This path file, expanded below, registers our custom codec. In conclusion, future fstrings provides three things. A custom UTF-8-based codec that does source transformation from fstring code to format calls, a command line interface to show this transformation, and lastly, a path file which automatically registers this codec during startup. The interpreter recognizes the encoding cookie at the top of the file and uses that to decode the source. In our case, a side effect of decoding the source causes the syntax to be rewritten. Thank you all for watching, and have a good one!